Well, hello, Administrator. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Why don't we just get right into it? Uh, and uh, so on our mission on New Shepard, we have some sensor technology that's testing precision landing on the lunar surface. I bet you're just as excited as we are to see that that testing happen. Absolutely. So, you know, what's, what's amazing about NASA is we've got all these different parts of NASA. And one of the parts that's really important to the Artemis program is the, is the Space Technology Mission Directorate. And what they work on are, are technologies that are going to be important for, for the future. And, of course, terrain relative navigation, the ability to land very precisely um, in, in a location that might otherwise be very difficult to get to, uh, is a capability that they're developing. Um, and, and using the Flight Opportunities Program to test and evaluate this capability um, is, 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 is fantastic. And the fact that, you know, we have these commercial providers like Blue Origin that can fly into suborbital space and, and help us test these technologies. It's, a, it's an amazing relationship um, and, of course, critically important to accomplishing our mission. Wonderful. We think so, obviously, too, as well. Why is going back to the moon so important? Well, there's so much uh, left to learn about the moon, and not just how much we can learn, but also uh, what we can do from the moon that advances science. So, you know, we think about, um, you know, the value of the moon from a scientific perspective. We, you know, the moon doesn't have an active atmosphere, an active hydrosphere, an active you know, uh, magnetosphere. In other words, um, anything that impacted the moon billions of years ago is today right where it was billions of years ago. And that's not the case here on Earth. So we can get a lot of information about the early solar system by visiting the moon. Uh, we can also understand the sun, heliophysics. Uh, all of these subatomic charged particles that have been impacting the moon for all of these billions of years um, are all still there right where they were billions of years ago. That's not true here on Earth. So we can actually learn a lot about the sun. We can use the moon uh, for all kinds of science when we think about um, putting optical sensors on the moon so that we can detect exoplanets around, basically planets around other stars that have not yet been discovered. And then we can use you know, that tipper to, to, to train our more sophisticated satellites like the James Webb Space Telescope that will be launched in 2021. We can train, you know, the, that telescope to specifically target, you know, exoplanets that are discovered uh, from the, the surface of the moon using optics. Um, the other thing is we can use very low frequency uh, radio telescopes on the far side of the moon, where it's so quiet from an electromagnetic spectrum perspective, we, we can actually um, see the early universe from, from the far side of the moon. And in, in many cases, we can actually see all the way back to the dark ages. After the Big Bang and before first light appeared, we could actually see from the far side of the moon, we could see the dark ages. So the, the, this, the, the moon represents heliophysics, the study of the sun, astrophysics, the study of deep space. It also represents planetary science. We need to go to the moon so that we can learn how to live and work on another world for long periods of time because we have an agenda to get to Mars. And of course, the, the, the moon and the earth, you know, were, were formed about, you know, together at about the same time. And so we can learn a lot about the earth by going to the moon. So just from a pure scientific perspective, the moon has so much value that in the, you know, the 1960s and early 1970s, um, th those kind of thoughts were not even, uh, were not even being entertained. Back then it was about demonstrating technological prowess for geopolitical reasons. And today it's about going sustainably to another world for long periods of time, using the resources of that world, the water ice, hundreds of millions of tons of water ice for life support, which, you know, air to breathe and water to drink and, and hydrogen for fuel, all available on the surface of the moon. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to go back. Uh, to, to the moon, and I should say forward to the moon, because this time we're going to stay. Um, and, and we're very excited about all of these opportunities. Wonderful. Obviously, as you said, a lot of opportunities, a lot of scientific opportunities, technical opportunities. What sort of technology is NASA developing to return to the moon? 
So we're going to need a lot of power on the surface of the moon. So we have a program that we call Kilopower um, that is that is going to be useful ultimately to um, to basically operate our missions on the moon. We need to we need to get to where the water ice is on the South Pole. We need to characterize that water ice. How is it embedded in the regolith? Maybe there's even pure water ice in the cold traps, the craters on the moon. How do we get to it? And of course, that's why this particular mission uh, that, that, that we're launching here with Blue Origin is so important because we need to get to those really difficult uh, places where, where the most valuable volatiles happen to be. And of course, that's on the South Pole in the cold traps where it's sometimes very difficult to land. Um, but we need to characterize the water ice. We need, we need to separate the water ice from the regolith. And then we need to take that water and crack it into hydrogen and oxygen. Ox, of course, for life support, hydrogen for fuel. Um, and we need to use the resources of the moon to learn how to live and work for long periods of time. Ultimately, we do that at the moon because when we go to Mars, we have to be on Mars for long periods of time. And the moon is the, moon is the place to learn how to do all of these things. Well, how are our commercial programs, suborbital programs like New Shepard, helping NASA achieve its missions? Uh, it's, it's critically important. So we think about um, the, the value of microgravity, the challenge of microgravity when it comes to human spaceflight and technology development, things like printing in 3D in low gravity or microgravity environments. These are all capabilities and technologies that have to be developed. Well, when we think about microgravity, there's a number of ways to get it. Number one is you can use a drop tower, and you might get a second, maybe a second and a half of microgravity. Uh, we can use airplanes that fly on a parabolic trajectory, and there you can get 20 to 30 seconds of microgravity. Beyond that, the way, the way it's been for decades now is you have to go all the way to orbit the Earth. Um, and, and, of course, that's tremendously expensive to launch a rocket to the International Space Station uh, dock and then do your experiments there. That's tremendously expensive. But if we could launch suborbitally and have maybe five to ten minutes of microgravity where we can actually test technology and do training and do scientific experiments, there's, there's a very valuable resource there um, that is not available in any other way. And that's really what these commercial suborbital capabilities like the New Shepard bring to NASA. It's really that five to 10 minutes of microgravity that is tremendously valuable from an experimental perspective uh, that we need to take advantage of. And of course, that suborbital crew program uh, that is uh, now underway, obviously, is going to be a tremendous support to, to, uh, to linking suborbital programs like New Shepard to, to NASA and some of the programs are doing. So we're looking forward to that as well. Absolutely. So a couple of my initiatives when I became the NASA administrator is, hey, we want to not just launch experimental payloads on commercial suborbital vehicles. What if some of those payloads need to be human tended? Um, and, and so we are, we're, now, we're now launching human tended payloads. We've actually got proposals that are being received from universities to do NASA experiments that are going to be human tended. Um, and, and those selections are, are underway right now. And then, and then, you know, beyond the human tended payloads, you know, we, we want to be able to, to do training for astronauts um, and, and other experiments in, in space as well. So I think there's lots of opportunity for suborbital human spaceflight, and NASA wants to be a great customer there. Well, I've got a, a, a question for you. So obviously your, your job at NASA is to lead uh, one of the most forward-thinking uh, agencies in the, in the government. Talking about forward thinking, the next generations look to NASA, look, look to space, look to the stars, look to this, this type of industry for, for excitement. How, why is it important to support STEM and to support the next generations as you think about NASA and, and, and your leadership within the agency? Yeah, so I'm the first NASA administrator in history that was not alive when we had people living and working on another world. I was born in 1975. The last time we had people on the moon was 1972. Uh, that is a failure of the United States of America. And, not, and now we're, going, we're not going back, we're going forward to the moon. This time when we go, we're going to stay. We loved the Apollo program. What an amazing era in, in human history. But it's also true that it ended 
we want to make sure that what we create today is sustainable for the long term. And so inspiring that next generation, bringing in people into the STEM fields is critically important to the sustainable agenda um, that, that we have before us right now. And when we think about Artemis in particular, we, we all know, you know, we remember um, Apollo, and Apollo had a twin sister in Greek mythology. Apollo's twin sister was Artemis, and she was the goddess of the moon. So here we are, 50 years after Apollo, we're going back to the moon sustainably, and we're also going with this very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women, and we're going under the name of Apollo's twin sister. So I think the Artemis program and building these capabilities that New Shepard is enabling us to build, um, are, these are critical things uh, to inspire that next generation to develop the sustainable program that is important not just for the United States of America, but important for us as we lead the entire world. Absolutely. Well, you know, at, at Blue Origin, we have the, uh, the Club for the Future, which is our program that is also meant to inspire uh, the next generation of, of space explorers and scientists and, and engineers. Uh, you also probably know we put uh, postcards. We have uh, kids draw their visions for the future on on postcards, and we're going to be flying those on New Shepard along with the uh, with the other payloads. I'm curious if you could draw on one of those postcards. What would you put? What is your vision for the future? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, I, I would. There's no no. There's no question. I would draw my family. Um, most important thing in my life is is my family, and uh, and so I would I would definitely put them on a postcard. The challenge is um, I might have to draw them as stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my artistic capabilities aren't quite there, but um, but I would definitely put my family on a postcard and, and send them to space and and dream about a future when you know humanity is going to be living off the earth. And, and not just our astronauts. We think about our astronauts. You know, they all have, you know, three PhDs or they're military test pilots. You know, all of these, you know, uh, amazing people. But, but the future is a day when, when anybody can have access to space. That's what we need to achieve. Um, you know, there was a day when uh, only rich people flew on airplanes because it was so expensive and rare. Um, and, and yet that day changed. And we need that to change for space flight as well. And that's what we're working on every day at NASA. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, as always, for your support. It's been my pleasure. And uh, let, let's, let's go New Shepard. Let's get this mission accomplished and, and see what great things come from it. Thank you so much. Let's light this candle. There you go.